So here we are, Grace uh, in the Book of Romans. That's the title of this uh, series. This is lesson number two. And the title of this lesson is The Renouncing of Grace, uh, part one, where we're going to break up this material into two parts. So last week uh, we began our series in the uh, Book of Romans and I told you that uh, we'd be tracing the idea of grace as Paul explains it in this um, epistle. So this particular class, this particular study, we're not doing a line by line, you know, uh, paragraph by paragraph study of the Book of Romans. It's called a thematic study. So we're, we're picking up a theme, we're picking up an idea and the idea is the idea of, of grace that Paul talks about throughout this, uh, throughout this epistle. We, we could study the idea of Christ. What does Paul say about Christ in Romans? What does Paul say about faith in Romans? You know, so there are so many themes that we could look at uh, and continue to go back through uh, this uh, wonderful uh, epistle, but we've chosen the idea of uh, grace. So um, we've said that the, um, the, um, our course is divided into uh, different sections. We're going to look at different sections to cover the book of Romans. Five parts. Uh, part one, renouncing of grace. Chapter one, verse one to chapter three, verse uh, 20. The next part will be the response of grace. Uh, chapter 320 to 725, the request of grace. Chapter eight. The Refusal of Grace, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and The Result of Grace, chapters 12 to 16. So that's kind of our outline, the outline of the study that we will use for this, for this book. So this week we begin with the very first section where Paul explains how mankind has renounced grace, God's grace, and how this renunciation has led to universal sin. And that's chapter one, verse one to chapter three, verse 20. That, that whole section is about this point, okay? So in the opening verses of the book, Paul greets his readers by establishing his credentials as an apostle, um, by summarizing the gospel itself, and he offers a blessing upon the readers themselves. He also states his own objectives in ministry, and that is to preach to all men the gospel, both Jews and Greeks, and that the gospel is God's power to save them. And then he begins his effort to show that all men need this gospel, and he does so by explaining this idea of the universality of sin. Okay. So before we examine Paul's teaching on the universality of sin, we need to look at an opposing view called the universality of salvation, or by its more modern name, pluralism. Universalism or plurism is a popular idea in the religious world today that says that the love and the grace of God virtually ensures that everyone will be saved no matter what path they choose. In other words, God is so good that just nobody will be lost. It's impossible that anybody can be lost because God is so good. If I were to you know, make a diagram, you know the old story, all roads lead to God, all roads lead to heaven, all religions lead to God. That's the idea of universalism. That's the idea of pluralism. Uh, uh, when explaining this, people say, well, each religion is distinctive because of culture and geography and history. You know, Hinduism, you know, it, it's been affected by the culture in which that religion developed. That's what people say, right? But then people say, all of these religions are capable of leading a person to God and thus salvation. So you can, you, know, you can get to God through Hinduism or through Islam or through Buddhism or through Jainism or through whatever-ism, Christianity, Mormonism, you know, all the roads they lead, as long as you're on one of these roads, they lead to God. Now some Christian pluralists teach that every religion is really a form of underdeveloped Christianity. And when that religion matures, 
it actually leads a person to Christ. So they say like uh, Hinduism, for example, is a primitive kind of Christianity. And they say that when, when the Hindus you know, follow their religion to its maximum ideal, eventually they'll find Christ. Now, major Christian denominations, you know, Presbyterianism and uh, you know, other, other Catholicism, so on and so forth, major Christian denominations have a smaller version of pluralism that says this. It says, um, all churches lead to heaven, but not all religions. So certain Christian pluralists they say, well, Buddhism doesn't take you to heaven and Hinduism, that doesn't take you to heaven. But all forms of Christianity take you to heaven. And in a diagram form, they, 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 they say that every religion is just a branch on the tree of Christianity. Just, you know, different, different way to get to the same thing. Um, some uh, it's the same pluralistic idea, but it's restricted to Christianity. And people who believe this, people who accept this, they use language like, uh, well, of what religious expression are you? What Christian expression are you? Or what fellowship of believers do you belong to? And so on and so forth. And this is just code for, hey, underneath we're all the same. It's all the same business. We all believe in Christ in one way or another, and we're all going to the same place anyways. Now, these ideas, they're easy to understand, right? All roads lead to heaven, or all Christian denominations, part of a tree you know, that's all the same thing. Very easy to understand, actually very attractive and very comforting. No arguing here. You know, I mean, if everybody's going to heaven, there's, just, there's no debating, there's no arguing, there's no working. It seems like a much more loving type thing, doesn't it? I mean, if you're able to say, hey, all religions, everybody's going to heaven. I'm just full of love. I'm saying that because God is love. That must be the way it works. Well, it, it's, the way it, you know, it's the way a lot of people would like it to work until you begin to examine it. That's the problem. When you examine it, it doesn't hold up for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is illogical. It is illogical that God, who is perfectly logical, would give different and even contradicting information about Himself and how to reach Him to different people simultaneously. It's like saying to two people at the same time, uh, the way to reach me, and you say to that person, I'll be, in, uh, I'll be in New York on January 1st, and to this person you say, I'll be in Los Angeles on January 1st. Contradicting information. You know, Eastern religions, like Hinduism and Jainism and Buddhism, so on and so forth, they teach that man is responsible to reach a state of perfection, or as some call it, nirvana, and union with the force of life through either a cycle of reincarnation, personal effort, and or acquiring special knowledge and insight through meditation and self-denial. That kind of summarizes the ideas of Eastern religions. Western religions that include Judaism, Christianity, even Islam, uh, they teach basically that God helps man to come to Him, that He dies once and then God judges each man. Well, that's <laughs> That's not reincarnation, is it? Eastern religions see God as a force without personality or will. Western religions see Him as sovereign, intelligent, Lord. Well, that's not the same thing, is it? Eastern religions are inclusive for all religious beliefs. Western religions are exclusive. Only one religion is the true religion. Again, contradictory. The point here is that the information about Hinduism will not lead a person to the same God and the same result as the information on Islam, for example, or the information on Christianity. It won't get you to the same place. It will not create in you the same idea, the same concept of who God is, or what God wants, or what God does. 
a logical God does not purposefully give conflicting, illogical, and confusing information about how to find Him. That would be cruel. Another problem, universalism is unbiblical from, from a Christian perspective. The Bible, and especially the book of Romans, has a, a very exclusive view of the Christian religion. It does assure that all Christians, that they are positively and completely saved forever and ever, absolutely. But the Bible also emphatically declares that those who are not Christians will perish. That's pretty clear in the book of Romans and other places in the Bible. It is for this reason that Christian, the Christian religion was so despised at the beginning when it, when it started in the first century. You know, when all religions were inclusive, you, you could be you know, a collector of gods and religions, you know, the more the barrier. You know, this is the world that, that, that the apostles were in and in, a, in, in the world that they were preaching to. They were preaching to a world where people had many gods. The more gods, the better, bring them on. And they come up and say, sorry about that, there's only one God, only one. And then Peter says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's why they were hated. They, they weren't hated because you know, they were you know, taking care of orphans or because they lived a moral life, like they were, they were striving to be sexually pure in their life. They weren't hated because of that. They were hated because they stood up and said, well, I'm sorry about your 10 gods, but none of them are gods. There's only one God and that's Jesus, uh, you know, that's, 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 that's come in, in person and that's Jesus Christ. Only through Him can you go to heaven. Well, people didn't like that. I know, there's a lot of other, I know there are a lot of other political reasons you know, for, the, uh, you know, for the persecution, but certainly the, the hatred of the people was based on that. And you know what? Nothing has changed today. If you declare that only through Christ can you be saved. Oh my, that is so politically incorrect today to say a thing like that. So nothing has changed. They weren't martyred because Christianity was a new or different religion. They were despised because the disciples of Jesus dared to say it was the only religion. And so the first three chapters of Romans explains why and how this is so. And it sets the stage to explain why Christianity is the only religion that deals effectively with man's basic problem, which is the problem of sin. Okay. So in Romans chapter one, two, and three, among other things, Paul describes man's true condition. And his true condition is he's fallen from grace. He's renounced the grace of God. Now we know that man began as good. He was the recipient of God's grace as the head of creation, the partaker of the divine nature, an intimacy with God that he shared. This was God's very first expression of grace towards man, the creation and putting man at the head of creation. That was God's initial expression of grace. And man, through disobedience, fell or renounced this grace and came into the condition that Paul describes in Romans chapters one, two, and three. So he begins describing this fall from grace by describing the process of sin itself and how this leads to judgment and death. So let's read chapters one, verse 18. Like I said, this is not a line by line study. I'm just picking certain passages that support and describe our theme. So verse 18, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So Paul is explaining here that God will punish all those who refuse and willingly suppress the truth. Well, 
what is the truth? Well, the truth is there is a God and this God can be known and this God is to be obeyed. This is the truth. And Paul says man has willingly suppressed this truth. The best example I can give you is, you ever take a beach ball in a, sw in a swimming pool? If you just throw it on the, into the pool, what'll happen? It'll float, right? It'll float on the surface. You have to hold the beach ball underwater to, to get it underwater. You have to suppress it to get it underwater. Well, this is what Paul is saying. The truth has a buoyancy. It wants to rise up. The knowledge that there is a God and He's the one who's created everything and that we, we ought to you know, obey Him. You know, that truth has buoyancy. It wants to rise up. And Paul is saying that sinful men have suppressed this truth, have kept it down willingly, because if they didn't do that, the truth would simply rise up. In verse 18 to 20, he continues and says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal powers, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So God, or the truth, is known in two very natural ways that Paul mentions here, through conscience and through creation. Every person can come to know God and his attributes through either or both of these means. A person who is blind and, and, and cannot speak can still know there is a God through conscience. So these two witnesses, Paul says, the creation and our own conscience, are so overpowering that no one can plead ignorance. No one can plead ignorance. You know, you're driving along and every quarter mile there's a sign that says 45 miles an hour, 45 miles an hour, and you're doing 63. And you get pulled over and you say to the policeman, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> really, is it? You didn't see all those 45, you think we were just, that was just a suggestion? Same thing. Paul is saying nobody can say, oh, I didn't know there was a God. I, I, Really? The stars in the heaven, you never had the thought, who put those there? So in verses 21 to 23, we continue. He says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So rather than responding to a fundamental truth that man has always known, a fundamental truth that was always there, man, historically, collectively, and individually, has chosen instead, Paul says, not to acknowledge or honor God. Refused to be grateful, even when he did acknowledge God chose rather to worship, worship baser things expressed in pagan religions, seeing in these a wisdom devised in their own minds. In other words, you'd rather worship things that you created yourselves than worship the God that created you. So instead of letting the truth emerge, Paul says man has chosen to pursue the course that I've just described not to acknowledge God, not to thank Him, not to worship Him, but rather to create His own gods, His own way. Then in verse 24 and five he says, therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature, rather than the Creator who is blessed forever, amen. So, the net result of all of this was that God did not intervene. God permitted them to sin to their heart's content. You don't want to know me? You don't want to obey me? You don't want to honor me? Fine. You like sin? You like paganism? You like that? Go ahead. Fill her up. Fill her up. And so Paul in the final verses describes some of the sins that this fall from grace 
and this process of sin led them to. Now understand here, Paul, Paul is not describing a single person or a single nation. He's describing a natural progression of humanity that forsakes God. This is what happens. And so the progression, there's the refusal to acknowledge God as God. It, it starts there. Whether it's a, a person, a nation, or all of humanity, it starts there. And that is followed by a refusal to respond with thanksgiving. So if you, re, if you refuse to acknowledge that God is God, well, you're not going to give thanks for anything. Who are you going to thank? You, you, you're not acknowledging God. And that will lead to a creation of personal gods divide by, uh, devised by human minds to fulfill the need of the human soul for the truth of God. You know what is so strange? We're designed in such a way that we want to worship. We, we have to worship. It's part of our, you know, we're wired to worship. And so the sad thing is if we reject the true God, eventually the, the need to worship will find a way out. And we'll end up worshiping things that are not God. And Paul says the last step is a downward plunge into active evil. Now in an historical sense, the, the process is as follows. In a, is in a kind of a macro view of history, if you looked at history and if you, if you looked at this, this kind of process here, this downward fall, this is what it looks like. You begin with grace, God's expression of grace. Uh, and then when you reject God, when you reject grace, the first thing to fall is your theology. So there's a theological fall because you're not acknowledging the true God anymore. Well, a theological fall leads to a philosophical fall because so long as you're acknowledging God, your philosophy, your thinking, about life and how it works, it's orderly because you understand there is God, there's the creation, there's me. You, know, you understand the relationship between yourself and your creator. But if you reject God and you know, there's your theological fall, well then your thinking will also fall. And you're going to begin creating scenarios to explain how life is. Where does it come from? And you, you start having all of these philosophical ideas that explain reality, that explain the world without reference to God. Well, there, that's a theological fall, a, a philosophical fall, sorry. And that philosophical fall is followed by a moral fall. People start acting in ways that are ungodly. And so that's what Paul is talking about in a, in a kind of a macro sense here. The, value, the rejection of values of right and wrong. By the time you get to a moral fall, you're at a point where as a nation you're saying, well, you know, good is bad and bad is good. That's, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Wait a minute, the Christians are the bad guys in this society. And those who promote immoral sexual lifestyle, they're the good guys. They get the headlines. <laughs> they get the parades. We've seen this cycle in history, right? The creation, that's the, you know, and then the garden, boom, the fall. Seth comes along and men once again begin calling on the name of the Lord. And what happens? We get to the flood where God destroys everything. And then post-diluvian means after the flood, everything starts over again. What happens? We get to the Tower of Babel <laughs> where, where, where humanity wants to rise up. God has to spread him out. Then you have Abraham, a hope to the crucifixion. And then you have the apostolic age, the apostles, you know, the church is growing, things are happening, kind of a, you know, a great revival. Whoops, then we get to the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. And then we have the Reformation, 
you know, back to the Bible, back to God. Tremendous religious renewal in Europe and so on and so forth. Whoops. Then we get to the enlightenment. The enlightenment with philosophers who said, well, man, man is the center of everything. We, we can invent stuff. Technology will solve all our problems. The artists you know, have been set free. We don't need God. We can explain how everything happened. It's called evolution. That's all the product of the enlightenment. You know, it's always the same circle going round and round. Then we have the restoration. Oh, now we're getting close to our own history, right? The great awakening, they called it. Another back to the Bible movement that swept across Europe, especially across America for a hundred years to the point where in the 1950s, and you've heard this before, the Churches of Christ, that restoration movement, let's get back to the Bible, do Bible things, Bible ways, you know, fastest growing religious group in America. And now we're at the present. And where are we now? Good is bad, bad is good. It's just a cycle. Some people say, well, why aren't you more why aren't you more excited and why aren't you more afraid? You know, well, because it's just the same stuff going around all the time, round and round and round and round. So we see this cycle in modern history, don't we? The theological fall came with the rejection of the Bible and inspiration in most mainline denominations in the last 50 years spearheaded by scholars of the higher critical method. In other words, Bible scholars were not looking to see what does the Bible teach and what does it say in context. They just saw the Bible as literature. No inspiration whatsoever. And these scholars began to influence the writers and the ministers and the leaders because ministers go to seminaries and seminaries are populated by you know, intellectuals and intellectuals were buying into this stuff. So you know, ministers brought this back to their churches. The fact that a gay woman can be a pastor of a Methodist church, that doesn't happen overnight. That takes 75 years to happen, but it happens. I tell people, you want to send your kid to Harvard? Sure, if you want him to go to business school there, but don't send him to the divinity department because he'll come out, he won't even believe in God, let alone be a minister. And so they influence the writers and ministers and leaders to reject the Bible as authority and rely more on social and psychological sources for ministry models and church models and moral issues. You know, Lutheran churches ordain active homosexuals because it no longer considers the Bible as an authority. And then we have the philosophical fall. I'm just talking about the, the latest cycle in our lifetime. This occurred simultaneously with great thinkers establishing relativism as the new basis for thinking about ourselves and our world. Relativism has many variations, but basically it says that the only rules that one is bound by are the rules that one creates for himself. As long as you don't hurt anyone else, that's the only, that's the only rule. So we see this thinking expressed in the pro-choice movement. No one can impose a standard on the individual that he or she has that has not been chosen by that person for themselves. So the ability to choose for yourself how you live and what you do trumps God's command. Social laws become valid because they have been chosen by the majority. They really don't have any values in themselves. You know, we believe that basic laws should be there because they are naturally good. Thou shalt not steal, that's a good thing. That's why it should be a law, aside from the fact that God has given the law. But in relativism, the law is there because it serves us somehow. And when, we're, when we don't like that law anymore, we get rid of that law. And now in our country, we have an institution that helps us do that. What's it called? Well, it's called the Supreme Court. 
Imagine one person's vote, one person's vote has changed 6,000 years of social conduct. One person's vote has said from now on, every court in the land must permit two men or two women to be married. One vote. Government, politics, law, this becomes very important in a relativistic world because there are the, these are the only vehicles to establish what a society is to be. We need to be afraid of a society completely dependent on relativism. We need to be afraid of a country like Russia, for example, becoming a complete democracy without any religious conscience because fueled by our capitalistic system, a nation that is totally relativistic could choose to collectively destroy us and have the money to do it and feel absolutely no remorse because it was the will of the nation. It isn't that might makes right, that's what Nietzsche said. It's the majority has the priority. So in a relativistic world, there's no such thing as loving your enemy because a majority of people would never choose to adopt such a policy. Only a religious people would adopt this type of policy. And in our nation, that group is shrinking. And then the philosophical fall always followed by a moral fall. So we are currently experiencing the moral fall of the West. The East fell with communism and secularism in Europe. When homosexuals march in the streets for their rights, when governments openly rob their own people, when God's name is publicly blasphemed before millions of people in the media day after day after day with no outrage and no way to stop it. When we glorify and we pour adulation on liars, thieves, fornicators and God-haters as we do on many of our entertainers and sports people who publicly act this way without shame. No shame. A woman who is a mother will expose herself completely naked to millions of people and be considered a hero or a heroine. When a man begins to dress like a woman and is given awards for that action. <laughs> when this type of systemic immorality becomes clear and visible to all, then three things are near. Number one, we are nearing the end or the bottom of the moral fall. You can't get much lower. You cannot get much lower that, uh, in your society that child molesters claim that they were born that way and asked not to be penalized because of that reason. And some of you might be saying, oh, that's terrible. That would never happen. Oh, really? It's already happening. It's already the most common defense for pedophiles. I can't help it. I was born that way. That's just the way that I am. You know, you know, they're seeking mercy from the courts for their actions. Or we're near the beginning of another period of God's grace as the cycle begins a new phase in history. This is seen in the working of the Holy Spirit strengthening the church to grow dynamically. This is seen in spiritual and moral fervor for Christ among the people. Not just any revival of religion, you know, not greater Islam, but the rise once again of the church that belongs to Christ. You understand what I'm talking about here? In this cycle here, where are we at? Well, I think, you know, if you just look at society, we're at, we're at the moral fall part of society. And the question is, well, what happens after the moral fall? Well, revival, hopefully. Historically, it's always been revival. People kind of swing back. 
or we're near the end of the world brought on by the return of Jesus. Because it is when there, there is the greatest challenge to God's authority and position, the Bible says that that's when Jesus returns. This is what 2 Thessalonians teaches. Now, without you know, getting too uh, you know, spectacular here, the book of Thessalonians also says that the man of lawlessness has to be revealed to Christians before the end comes. And I've not seen any sign of the man of lawlessness been, uh, being revealed, so I doubt we are at this particular point yet. However, according to the Bible, this is how it's going to work. So this cycle, you know, theological fall, philosophical fall, moral fall, and either the return of Jesus or revival, you know, this just keeps going round and round and round and round. That's why the encouragement to the church is always be faithful. Understand that you're living in a world that just keeps going round and round like this. Be faithful. So in chapter one, so you're saying, what does this have to do with Romans? Well, in chapter one of Romans, Paul is describing this cycle of falling from grace and how all humans are caught up in it in one way or another. In chapter two and three, he goes from a macrocosmic, in other words, a big picture view, which is what he gives in chapter one, to a microcosmic, a detailed view of the very same thing. So in chapter one, he describes this cycle on, like on a worldview, and in chapters two and three, he's going to kind of narrow it down and describe it on a very personal view. So from the moral history of mankind to the working of sin in the heart of each individual person and the results of this in the lives of individual Jews and Gentiles. So the lesson for us so far is that this cycle continues and each of us is caught up in it despite our advanced technology, despite our global worldview. And the moral collapse of society is played out in each of our personal lives as well. And in the end, these remain, there remains only one name under heaven by which we must be saved also, Jesus Christ. That's the thing that just remains throughout, the, throughout this history. The power of the gospel, which is the revealed grace of God, is just as powerful today as it was then, and it will be just as powerful in the future. So when we study Romans, or any other book in the Bible for that matter, we're handling that power, we're handling that spirit, we're handling that life that can lead us to a state of grace or can ignite a period of grace for the whole world if we're not ashamed of it. They weren't ashamed of it in the first century and they were in the throes of a moral fall. I think we're similarly in the throes of a moral fall in our generation. And our response is not to worry or to be afraid, our response is not to be ashamed of the gospel as the power of God to save mankind, even in our age today. Such is the power of the gospel, as Paul will say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay, in our next lesson, we're going to discuss part two the renunciation of God's grace and His judgment. We're going to go into a more focused view of that. All right, that's our lesson for this morning. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.